Otangelo, thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with us at Politics Discord today. We really appreciate your time here. Um, we'll go ahead and get started here. This is going to be an, a Q&A moving into an a and AMA. And so what we'll do here is I'll ask you some questions. We'll have a little bit of back and forth. And then we'll start unmuting the audience members and we'll have an open discussion with questions and whatnot. I'm sure some people are going to want to debate you. Uh, now, let's just start out. Tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Yeah, for who doesn't know me, I am Swiss Italian. I live in Brazil. Um, uh, I'm a evangelical Christian since 1984. I have, since I converted, always focused on being an evangelist to bring the gospel to people. And over the years, that has developed uh, in my constant interactions with atheists. To, to educate myself, I am basically an autodidact. I don't have any scientific uh, credentials uh, in regards of uh, the usual topics that I'm talking about. So I just self-educate myself. And based on that knowledge that I am acquiring, uh, or reading books and science papers and so forth, based on that knowledge, then I, I have my conversations and debates, basically. So you took the time to educate yourself so that you felt like you were, well, well-educated on the topics so that you could engage on a number of different scientific topics with people. Well, I mean, during my interactions with atheists, always uh, different questions come up. And in order to be capable to um, learn about different topics, uh, I had to investigate and uh, basically, that has been a driving motivator to go deeper and deeper into the issues re rel relative to origins in general. I gotcha. Do you want to talk some about your origins research? Uh, yeah, I'm. I have um, a virtual library where I basically post uh, my stuff, my research. Um, I think a, a breakthrough was in 2015 when I got hand to first biochemistry books like uh, Bruce Albert's um, Biochemistry of the Cell. That was a big major advancement for myself to educate myself in regards of biochemistry. Uh, then came questions about origin of life, evolution, origin of the universe. Uh, I met uh, Bill Craig in 2012 when he came here to Brazil. Oh, cool. Yeah, and that was quite um, um, the progress, let's say, in regards to to learn about the arguments in regards of the universe. I'd say. Tell me about your oh. conversation. Is that are you talking about William Lane Craig? Yes. Yes. Tell me about your conversation with him. I'd love to hear that. Well, we had um, a breakfast together, me, his wife, and him. Um, at that congress, which was in Aguas de Lindoya, that is uh, the state of Rio, of Sao Paulo. Oh, cool. And yeah, and it was um, before he went to Aguas de Lindoya, he had um, also um, a speech in Sao Paulo, which I attended. And it was basically about uh, structuring epistemology. And that was really enlightening for me too, because Usually atheists, they say, well, proof, proof that God exists. And he was addressing this and saying that scientism or verificationism is a philosophical approach, which was basically uh, passé in the 60s, in the last century, when um, philosophers, they, they brought up good arguments why this is not a good epistemological approach to investigate origins. And basically, that was my, um, uh, I'd say, basis to um, uh, adopt the, the, the framework that you have basically three legs, that is science, philosophy, and theology, um, to investigate, to com come up with a sound um, uh, inference in regards of origins. So after meeting with you said that was a breakthrough for you right so where did that take you in your research after having this sounds like an amazing day with william lane craig 
Yeah, I think that he influenced my thinking. He had a positive impact on me. And um, I think that the that the question which is always surrounding um, the debate is about evidence. And basically what I am saying is that nobody has access to ultimate reality, to the metaphysical reality. So whatever position that you take, uh, be it theism or atheism or naturalism, um, it is always um, a position to take at, um, on faith. So if an atheist uh, says uh, that he believes there is no God, that is also a faith-based claim. He cannot prove that the natural physical world is all there is. So I say that the, a sound approach is what is um, basically what uh, intelligent design says, uh, inference to the best explanation. So acknowledging that nobody has absolute proof in regards of ultimate reality, and all we can do is put the evidence on the table and then see where it leads. And the end result will be um, inference to the best explanation. Gotcha. Now, you're quite an accomplished author. In fact, you've wrote many books. Could you talk to us about that process? How does one take the time I mean, I guess I'm kind of doing that with the YouTube thing right now, where I, I see where you could get the time right, but how does one really buckle down to write, what was it, 10, 12 books, something like that? Yeah, something like that. I mean, anyone can search my name on Amazon and then see my my books, which I've published. Yeah, so I, I was asking, so how, how does one actually sit down and write down to 10, 10 to 12 books? What's that process look like? Well, the thing is that I I may be a little bit fortunate in regards um, to my time because um, I am a real estate developer. And um, when I started to invest in land plots, um, it was, it started about... 20 years ago or so, land was much cheaper here in Brazil. And I was just investing my money in, in land and started to make um, land developments. And um, today I'm not doing it by myself anymore, but I make partnerships with companies which do the de development. And my part is just getting in with the land. And that permits me to have free time, which I can spend doing what I like to do, which is to educate myself in regards of issues and origins. So um, um, first I have educated myself and putting all the information that I got in my into my virtual library. It has currently over 8,000 posts on many different topics. And then, um, I think two years ago or so, I started to think, well, maybe it would be interesting to to write a book rather than have it just online. And that that was then after six months or so, I published my first book in regards of uh, abiogenesis, the origin of life. And then my next book, I started it in October 2022, I've seen many atheist YouTubers claiming that Jesus is a myth, that the person never existed, histo historically speaking. And I said, well, let me just investigate this. And I did this investigation in a time period of about six months or so. And the result was a two volume book with about 900 pages, which, um, includes about 200 pages on the on the Shroud of Turin. After that book, I wrote another one in regards of um, the biosynthesis pathways to make RNA and DNA. And um, that was last year. And um, then we had already uh, chat GPT, which has been um, a great tool, I'd say, to to uh, speed up the process of writing. And what helps is that I have a lot of, of information already stored in my virtual library. 
so I can take these texts and rather than to just copy them one by one, I can put them into chat GTP and say to revert the information and then um, other questions come up and I can investigate deeper. And basically in this process, then um, the do development of a book arises. So that was basically the way I, I wrote the RNA DNA um, book. And gotcha. so, so just for confirmation, you built your guide, not because that sounded like you threw it into chat GPT. It sounds like you built your frame of reference. You fed your frame of reference into chat GPT and it helped you build from there, right? Right. Rather than simply copying a text from a textbook or from a science paper, I can put it into chat GPT and then just say rewrite the text. And then chat GPT gives me the same information, but just not one to one. But in, uh, in more, I would say 99% um, it advances or it, it gives a more sophisticated wording of the text. And that's oh, that. Yeah. And then I, I recheck the information, adapt it. Uh, there are some words which I know that uh, chat GPT uses very often, like intricate or tapestry, things like that. And I filter these words out to have not a, just too repetitive text. Gotcha. Make it easier for the reader to parse. Right. Yes. I'm with you. Now, what does the term evidentialist Christian mean to you? Well, for me, first of all, um, when I converted in 1984, it wasn't based on scientific evidence. It was based on me reading the Bible. I was a seeker because I had some personal difficulties. I had depression, I looked for a way out. And I said, well, let me pray and see and see if that helps. At that time, I started to read the Bible, had many questions. And then someone from my workplace, he uh, invited me to visit an evangelical church. I visited it. There they explained me the gospel. And I said, yes, I want to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. So um, I did repent of my sins and made the prayer. And that's, that was basically the starting point of my career, let's say, as a, as a Christian. But um, uh, I mean, the, the, the investigation in regards of origins, that was just a, a development that came with the constant challenge from the, from the unbeliever side. And in order to um, have answers, I had to investigate. So I'd say that the atheists have been a, a great um, factor or help for me to advance my understanding in regards of uh, questions related to origins in general. I got you. That's awesome. Now, how this is going to be kind of a controversial topic, so feel free to avoid it. But how do you feel about presuppositional apologists like Darth Dawkins? Well, you know, I've spent some time for who knows me um, to to uh, visit um, chat rooms like here on Discord, where he was more frequently interacting with um, atheists and. Um, I tried to learn about the approach and I'd say that I think it is not a very successful approach. That's that's my personal catch on it. And I've basically not adopted it. I continue with the evidentialist approach by providing um, reasons why I believe that the natural world points to a creator. Now, one of the users on the server actually DM'd me prior to this saying that you had a history with Darth Dawkins and they wanted to ask a question about that. Um, I wasn't really sure where they were going with it, but I'm very interested in knowing about your experience with Darth Dawkins. Can you tell me more about that? Well, I have always fun with Darth when, uh, when he is on the server and I come in and I mean, you need just to know how to interact with him. I mean, he like he likes a lot to dominate the room, to talk a lot. And if you can wait and don't interrupt him, then it is uh, very well possible to come good along with him. And I, that's my experience. I've come good along with him and I have always fun. Now, back to the 
I guess this is still religion, but what is your the best argument that you've encountered for atheism and why? You mean for theism, right? No, no, no. I'm asking on the atheist side because you obviously debate a lot of atheists. Mm -hmm. So what is the best atheistic argument you've ever encountered? That's a difficult question. To be very honest with you, I don't I don't know of any really good um argument from the opposite side. I mean, I've I've heard that the same question was made to Matt Dilahanti in a debate, and he said that it was the hiddenness of God. And I simply disagree with that. I mean, what I see often atheists saying, well, but um, prayer doesn't work. And I mean, this, these are maybe difficult issues to address. Maybe also the quest of um, evil. I mean, I have, I myself don't have all the answers in regards of the problem of evil. And I acknowledge that these are difficult Charging issues. Battery. Also the quest of slavery, which atheists come up often. But I'd say that there's not much an argument against the existence of God, but in regards of if God is moral or not. So, um, yeah. Gotcha. Do you think God is moral? Yes, he's the. He, I mean, he, I think that he is good um, in his own nature. So, whatever he does, he does emanating his goodness. And I think that the physical world is an emanation and expression of his goodness, the beauty, and everything else. All the, the good things that we can experience, in my understanding, is an expression of his goodness. And of course, and um, in special, I'd say that the greatest revelation of his goodness and love is Christ's crucifixion. Gotcha. Now, I know you mentioned evolution and abiogenesis earlier when you were talking about your books and how you wrote books against them I, I guess what evidence have you found against we'll start with evolution you mean evidence against evolution yeah what evidence do you have against evolution okay one has to make a distinction between small um, changes this is uh, something which is undisputed among uh, creationists as well. Adaptation is actually even, or microevolution, you can say it as well, is even a necessity for life to start because any organism has to be able to adapt to the environment. And I have some articles um, which say that evolution is a pre programmed process. That means that there are some sections of the genome which have a predisposition to. Uh, where uh, mutations can occur in a more frequent manner precisely to help the organism to adapt to the environment. Now, this doesn't touch to the main issue, which is what uh, the dispute is about. That is a uh, universal common ancestry and the tree of life. So the proposition that all life forms, they have originated from one universal common ancestor and then branched into the millions of species on earth over a billion billions of uh, years so this is something which i regard as unsupported i wrote the book of uh, in regards of evolution it's on amazon it has about 1400 pages where i dived in depth wow. into, into um, investigating what actually the mechanisms are that drive and explain organismal complexity and um, the gene-centric view is basically gone. So um, Dawkins, um, he wrote uh, the, 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 the book about this, the, the, the egoistic gene, something like that. I don't remember now exactly. And um, what, what science has um, 
unraveled in the last 10 or 15 years or so is that um, what actually uh, drives organismal complexity is much far beyond only genetic information. I have in my book a collection of 223 epigenetic codes. These are languages which exist in the cell beyond genetic information and hundreds and even thousands of different signaling pathways. And many of these signaling pathways and epigenetic codes and languages, they um, talk to each other. So there is communication between them and there is interdependence between them. That means if you have one code, but you don't have the other, then that code has no function and vice versa. And that is evidence that both codes had to come um, to originate together. And one of the most complex uh, processes in development is the development of the human brain. And I have a collection of uh, 47 different mechanisms in my book, which are responsible uh, to create organismal complexity. And 16 of these processes are directly involved in the development of the brain. And most of these processes, as I said before, they are interdependent. That means um, they have to function together. And I think that this is what basically is the real, are the real mechanisms. And now, of course, of course the question is, how did these mechanisms originate? And once you have interdependence, and once you have irreducible complexity, you cannot explain it anymore by gradative evolutionary processes. And I think um, a classic example is the interdependence between the gene regulatory network and the genetic information, because the genetic information has to be expressed at the right moment, at the right time, at the right place. And what is responsible for that is the gene regulatory network. And that had to be already extant at the inception of life. So you cannot express the genetic information if you don't have that orchestration. So there already you have an interdependence. And that means that these systems, they had to be originated together because one has no function without the other. The genetic information cannot be expressed without the gene regulatory network. And the gene regulatory network has no function without the genet with, without the genome. So, um, and that is just one level. Then we can go to the histone code, which is um, stored in the histone tails in eukaryotic cells. And that is another layer of information which orchestrates the, the, in, the expression of genetic information, uh, where, where you can have, where, where the, the proteins have access to, to that information or event, eventually not. And this, these are multi-layered processes which work in an orchestrated fashion together. And um, the thing is that science, even today, with all the advance it had, cannot still have a clear picture about how all these different mechanisms work in an orchestrated fashion together. That is, uh, one uh, fascinating thing is that of the 223 codes and languages, I know only of a handful that science has an understanding how these um, uh, informations are stored uh, through these languages. Like, for example, the, the glycon code or the, the sugar code. This is a code which is stored on, the, on proteins which are in the cell membrane of the cells. And there are some branchings coming out of the protein. Are, these, these are branches like a tree which are attached to the protein and these branches, they store uh, sugars and um, there are readers which can understand what this, this information means. And based on that information, then the uh, cellular pro and organismal processes can happen. This is one of the examples where we know how that information is stored. But for example, how the splicing code is stored, nobody knows, science doesn't know. And most of these hundreds of epigenetic codes, science still doesn't know how it is stored 
and has still also not unraveled what the actual code is. So we know in, in the genes, it is the genetic code. We have an understanding of that. But in regards of the spliceosome, the, the, the splice, splicing code, we don't know. And there, there are others like the Tallinn code, we don't know. There are many different codes also in the brain, we don't know. So science has no clue about um, uh, these processes yet. So um, there is still a, a long way to go to have more clear picture. But one thing we can clearly say already with what with the information that we already have on hand, that is that evolution unguided uh, mechanisms, gene centric mechanisms are simply inadequate to explain this complexity. Gotcha. Now we're gonna move into a more fun topic and we'll, we'll do a few more questions and then we'll move into the AMA. We've got a few people in here now. Um, now, this is a question I've asked to everybody. Now, I can tell you my favorite dinosaur is a Triceratops, and there's a number of reasons why. But, Otangelo, what is your favorite dinosaur and why? Well, I would say the trilobite. It's not a dinosaur, but um, it is a, um, a creature from the Cambrian, which is the trilobite because of its eyes, which are the most advanced eyes in the animal world. And um, there is absolutely no um, uh, evolutionary explanation how they could have evolved. And they are very soph sophisticated and elegant eyes. I'm with you. That's fascinating. Now, how do you feel about anti-theism? Are you familiar with anti-theism? Mesotheism, uh, people that... Um, they express less concern about the existence of God, but more about God's moral character. That's what you mean? Kind of. Anti-theism is more like in an anti-theistic position where you're going against the religious ideals and whatnot. And yeah, you could see evil in the Bible or Quran or whatever book you're referencing, right? But it's like an anti theistic position yeah i mean i often also ask atheists well let's suppose that god really exists would you really and let's say it is the christian god which i believe in the god of the bible would you bow to that god would you start to worship him would you start to follow jesus or or would you just continue to live autonomously and um, a very frequent answer that I'm getting to that question is, no, God is a moral monster. I would never bow to this God because of slavery, because of genocide in the Old Testament. And, um, yeah. Well, you know, I would say that it goes maybe a little in, into a little bit more fundamental questions like for example god had foreknowledge when he created this world right so he knew that adam and eve they would fall they would um uh, eat the, the forbidden fruit then um there was the fall which which brought um that catastrophe which we live in and that affected not only the humankind but as well um, the animal world and I mean the question is of course why should animals suffer for the fall of Adam and Eve I mean it really makes no sense to me and these are open questions which I really don't have um, a good answer to them right with you now Last question, and this is kind of off topic, but it's kind of like the dinosaur one, but are you scared of anything? No. Oh, Otangelo is fearless. That's a great time to unmute everybody and see how this goes. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute everybody. Otangelo does have mute power, so if somebody starts doing something crazy while I'm unmuting everybody, feel free to mute them. But uh, if anybody wants to chime in, you're feel free to ask Otangelo a question. Uh, this is an open floor AMA. 
everyone should be unmuted. You just might have to unmute on your end. I have a question. You seem to know uh, a lot about biology and so on and scripture. In Psalm, let me see if I can find it here. In Psalm 22, which we Christians believe it's about Jesus, the person is saying that I am a worm. Okay. Now, it used a specific Hebrew word here. Let me see if I can find it. Psalm 22. Um... Psalm 22, verse 6, okay? And it's a specific Hebrew name here. It says that Tovla'at, uh, tov something like that, yeah? Um, have you heard of this, like the life cycle of this little worm? Or, like, do you know what I'm talking about here? No, I don't. Okay. So basically, the life cycle of this specific worm, which is used here in Psalm, 22 um, have a lot of similarities to what Jesus did on the cross. An example, this worm is going up on a tree when it's about to have uh, kids or whatever, yeah? And it's hanging itself from the tree. And when the, they are born, uh, the blood, or it looks uh, like blood at least, will cover their children, right? Like just like the blood cover us in a way, right? Um, I was just see if you knew about this life cycle, if this is real or not, because I've seen a bunch of videos and so on making this claim. But uh, uh, I would like to see if someone who actually have knowledge about this knew it. But yeah, uh, I've never heard about this. I will send you a video. It's called the crimson worm. There you go, crimson worm. And. Yeah, well, that was my question. <laughs> yeah, send me a link and I'll watch the video. And, I sent um, the video. I'll... It's okay. very interesting if this is real. If what they're saying is real, this is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. right. And this crimson worm is also used other way in the Bible. And it's in connection with atonement, which is very interesting. It just happened to use this very specific one, which is used only a few times in Scripture in Psalm 22 which we believe it's about Jesus, yeah? So. Just wondering, where are you from? Sweden. Sweden? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you? I'm Swiss. Oh, okay, yeah. Now, this is an open floor. Anybody else feel free to jump in if anybody has any questions for the great Otangelo. This is a lobby of atheists. I'm sure someone's got something. So, Otangelo, do you claim to know that a god exists? Well, I make no absolute claims. I, I say that I very strongly believe that God exists based on Several lines of evidence. Hey, Taco, you mind if I ask a question? Yeah, it's an open floor. Go ahead. So uh, I, I kind of wanted to get clarification on this. Um, Otangelo, do you think that, uh, that atheism in and of itself is predicated upon, is predicated upon the truth of evolution or abiogenesis? No. Okay. So, okay, good. Awesome. So, obviously, even if we even if everything we knew about abiogenesis or evolution was incorrect, it still wouldn't be evidence that a god exists. Correct. Yes. Okay, awesome. Then, yeah, I just wanted to get clarification on that and I guess uh the the second question I had, which is a little bit easier, is like given uh, you know, all of the work that you've purportedly done and all the stuff all the stuff that you've accumulated, um why are you yet to be published and uh, have your work put through peer review? 
because I have no um, scientific degrees. I've never made um, a university, never f f finalized um, a biology course or something like that. So that's the reason. Well, those things, just to, you may not know, but those things uh, just have like having degrees or being like you're working for a university or even being a student there doesn't preclude you from getting your stuff published and submitted to peer reviewed sources. There's sources that do peer review. You don't have to have those credentials to do it. You can submit for the peer review process um, as a civilian, like as, as, as a, just a, a person who's like interested in the stuff because not all discoveries come from people in universities, you know, so, or students or even professors or even people working in the field. Like you may, as a hobbyist, you actually may make a discovery and you should have the, you have the right to submit that under your name. So that's what I'm kind of curious. It's kind of like, given the, the number of years you've put into this that I'm, and the books you've written and everything you've claimed, I'm kind of surprised that you, that you haven't submitted anything for, you know, for direct publishing, or at least to, to enter and enter your findings into the peer review process, because anybody can do it. Like I could do it. You could do it. Taco can, all of us can. Is that something you are? I mean, now that you know that, is that something that you're willing to do? Absolutely. Yes. Then I look forward to reading the, the uh, peer review findings of your work. Well, if you give me the, um, the, the, the ways how I can submit them, uh, anything I write, for others to peer review it, I'd say it is a great way to refine and uh, remove errors of uh, literature work. And um, I'm very open to it. Yeah, it's but really simple. You just you just Google any kind of evolutionary biology or origin of life research uh, journal, like, you know, like uh, official journal, and you can contact them and they'll walk you through the submission process to submit your work to peer review. Well, you know, the thing... Um, I'd say is not necessarily that I, for instance, disagree with the um, scientific um, results of empirical investigations. <laughs> I think there is little to to argue about what um, the, the 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 scientific papers have brought up for for all of us. But the dispute is where does that information or that evidence lead us? And there are basically two competing views. One is that an intelligence was involved in creating the biological world or the physical world. And the other proposition is that intelligence was not necessary. And that is basically a philosophical dispute and not a scientific dispute. And, um, I mean, my books, I try to um, put into my books what the scientific evidence is, quote and list the science papers. And then based on that, I give my interpretation and why I think that a determined or certain evidence is better explained by an intelligence uh, and agency rather than not. Okay, yeah, I understand that, but uh, there seems to be because there seems to be a slight contradiction there because you you mentioned it was a philosophical thing, but if you're talking about things that exist, and if you're talking about like the best possible the best possible and most logical explanation for any given phenomena, then that would that's a science claim. So this would this would like your what what you're concluding would go right at home in any in any evolutionary biology or any uh origin of life research journal because that's what that's where you're going is that this thing exists and it is directly responsible for the phenomena that for the for, for the various phenomena that we observe it's not that's not philosophical in any way because you're talking about things that exist and have direct causative properties so that seems right right at home is that i mean are you saying it's more are you kind of hedging more towards the philosophical side because you don't have the evidence to back that up? No, I would say like like this. Um, there, there are two um, faculties of science which make two distinct different questions. There is operational science which asks how do, do, do things operate? And you can test things in the laboratory 
and then you have an empirical um, result. And the other question is how did come things come to be? And this is an entirely different question and it belongs to historical science where the question is how did life come to be? How did biodiversity come to be? How did the universe come to be? And there, I mean, there you have um, empirical data, but when you want to use that data to make an inference to what happened in the past, then philosophy comes in. And then uh, there is the dispute here. Some think that the data points more to an unguided um, event, which doesn't require intelligence to guide that event. And eventually an intelligent design proponent, proponent will come to a different conclusion based on uh, 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 what he has learned that intelligence can do that eventually non-intelligent mechanisms cannot do. Well, <clears throat> it, it seems that the wires are a little crossed there because when you, you are correct in that we have to use what we, what we have access to now in order to infer what could possibly have occurred in the past. But when we're talking about that kind of how we're talking, we're talking about mechanistically, that's, we're talking about the mechanism behind like why these things took place. So all the different moving parts that led to a specific conclusion that we currently observe. So that's the mechanistic process, but philosophy would deal with kind of like the why in, in, in other words, it would ask, is there a purpose or an, a kind of like agential reason behind oh. these things being the way they are, or are they the way they are because the system itself does not allow them to be any other way. So they're just the, yeah, they're just the result, the result of the system itself. So that's where philosophy kind of goes. It's kind of go into like the purpose or the, or the reason behind these things, if there is an agential reason behind them, but science will always go to the mechanism. And when you're talking about an intelligence, whether or not you call that intelligence a God, you're talking about an entity that you believe exists that has a direct causative relation, a direct mechanistic relation with the phenomena that we currently observe that we should be able to take evidence now and trace it back to show the existence of this thing. So it shouldn't be something that you're simply positing <clears throat> answers the question because you've defined it as answering the question. There should be evidence that directly leads back to the existence of this thing due to the mechanical relate the, the mechanistic relationship it has with the phenomena so I, I guess my question is do you do you not have that or do you not have do you not have that to present for peer review okay so these are also two different questions one is the philosophical question what does best explain the origin of x and you have two competing answers. One is intelligence was involved to create X, and the other is intelligence was not involved to create X. This is what intelligent design uh, tries to figure out and also makes hypotheses which actually can be tested. And then of course, that what you just correctly said, there is the other philosophical question, well, if there was an agent which made the physical universe and life, what was the reason? And this goes into philosophy and also theology. But um, what I am focused on is the question of the variegated phenomena that we observe in the natural world. Okay, so on that, given that you you repeatedly refer to to the god hypothesis as the as the best explanation if we go from the god hypothesis and given how the god is defined it offers all these answers it kind of like is a stopgap it's kind of like god did it and therefore that is the explanation but saying that god did it doesn't give us all of the mechanistic relationships within the process by which it did the by which it did the phenomena so if we have the emergence of life and you're you're hypothesizing that it was a god that was behind it say it was even like it was abiogenesis but the process by which abiogenesis took place was the means by which the god created life so we that's logically possible that god used a natural method it didn't use magic it used a natural means to bring about life so there's no logical contradiction there but the problem is is that 
because we can't identify the mechanistic relationship between what God is doing and the phenomena, it literally is kind of like it just goes, God, stop, abiogenesis, start. But we can't see how the two connect is the problem. Now, in origin of life research, um, we see going back, we see as we, as we fill in the gaps in our knowledge, as we, as we explore and experiment, we begin to fill in the piece of the jigsaw puzzle. And none of those are pointing towards a God, or at least towards a relationship with a God, as if there's like a causative uh, connection there. We just keeps going back to more natural processes. And the problem with the God hypothesis is that the God hypothesis, hypothesis can consistently move backwards to encompass all of the evidence that we currently have, but it never gives a connection between the God uh, like a mechanistic connection between the God and the phenomena. It simply says, the hypothesis is, God did it. So that's the break point, is that as long as we can identify the mechanistic relationships between the moving parts, then you have, then you have the makings going towards an actual theory. But if you're just going to say God did it, you don't have that connection between the two. The, the mechanistic cause, like like what energy did God use? Where did the energy come from? Uh, did, God will the ener did God will the energy out of nothingness? It's like, these are important questions if you're going to work from the God hypothesis. So until you can work backwards and derive that connection between the, the creator, your creator, and the phenomena, then until you have that evidence, then all you're working with is an unfalsifiable hypothesis that can constantly move backwards to encompass all the evidence we get now and all the evidence we're going to get in the future. But it never actually connects the dots. It does. Think, in Genesis 1, it says he okay. speaks and it will sow. Um, okay, so so, so yes, like, how, do you plan to, how do you plan to reconcile that is my question. Yeah. First of all, um, a very basic principle in epistemology, epistemology is that you don't need an explanation of the explanation. So if I am saying God is the superior or intelligent designer is a superior explanation to explain the origin of life rather than unguided uh, uh, natural stochastic events, then this is based on what we see in uh, that is required. Now, I don't need to have an explanation of how God did it, what he used to do, to do it, how the process operated. It is not necessary that I give answers to these questions because then you can still go further back and question, well, but how did this happen? And then you have an infinite regress of questions and at the end you have no plausible um, answer to basically anything. And I think that's not how things work. And in regards of, well, there is no connection. Okay, I know that I can use my mind to conceptualize a blueprint to make a machine. I can then um, uh, transform that uh, blueprint in my mind into the physical object. I take a piece of paper, take my arm, take a, a pencil and write down that, that blueprint and then that transmission occurred. And I don't know how that interface mind physics operates, but I know it works. And the yeah, same yeah. principle, no, let me finish, please. Um. For the same, the same principle I apply in regards of the origin of life. And I love the topic of the origin of life because you cannot invoke natural selection because natural selection begin, begins when life starts. So you have much more clear picture because you have on the one side an intelligent agent and on the other side you have no intelligence involved. And um, we know that intelligence makes blueprints, intelligence makes um, complex machines, intelligence makes production lines, intelligence makes turbines, intelligence makes chemical factories, because we do all these things routinely and we know that intelligence is capable of instantiating these things. Now, I can make a hypothesis which can be scientifically tested. I can say um, information 
instructional complex specified information comes only from a mind. And this is a hypo hypothesis that can be tested and that it can be falsified. And that's precisely the, 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 the answer which I gave yesterday to T. Jump. And he said, oh no, we have thousands of science papers. We have already demonstrated that this is possible. But that is simply not true because we know the statistics. And I have investigated what the smallest genome would have to be to have a minimal life. And it is 2.6 million bits. It's 1.3 million nucleotides. It's gigantic. And you can calculate the odds to have a sequence with this size and it's 1 to 10 to the 722,000, which is completely outside of whatever would be statistically possible by unguided random means. Even a string of 100 amino acids, 200 bits, or, or, or 100 uh, nucleotides, 200 bits, that would be already outside of what is plausible. So um, this is scientific, and I say, hey, show me how this makes more sense than an intelligence, and I go for it. But so far, I think that intelligence has shown to be capable of instantiating instructional information, and natural uh, gu uh, unguided means have not. That's why I think that intelligent design is a superior, uh, uh, not only hypothesis, but theory, because it has uh, repeatedly been tested, and it works. Well... I hate I hate to say this, but that entire diatribe you just gave is not relevant to the question that I asked, because what I asked specifically was, if we can identify the mechanistic relationship between causes that result in the phenomena that we currently observe, and what you're hypothesizing, and you said it yourself, that you don't need to explain the details of the relationship between this this hypothesized creator and the phenomena. That's incorrect because that's not scientific. So that's the biggest issue there is like the whole purpose of, of we, yes, we ask these questions and we get deeper and deeper and deeper into them. So we, yes, we can continue to ask until there are no more questions to ask. We don't assume that there will never be a questions asked, but there may be a point where there are no more questions asked, where we have gotten to the full understanding of the phenomena, what's going on and what causes the phenomena. And then we just go on to, to ask questions about the thing that caused the phenomena. So that's what science does, because science doesn't simply stop. It doesn't, it doesn't hypothesize an answer and then simply stop by saying that this is the answer and then that's it. We ask, okay, well, how do we know that's the answer? What is the relationship between the answer and the phenomena? What, so we, do, we dive into it. We get those out. So if origin of life research is constantly finding the mechanistic relationships between the, ca the, the, the causal events and the phenomena we currently observe then that's a better explanation than just dropping in a god hypothesis and then defining the god as that which does the thing so by your own lights your god hypothesis can never be the best explanation because it's just a stopgap explanation that can always be shifted and moved to encompass all of the uh, all of the evidence that we get that we can ever find because even if we found even if we completely solve the abiogenesis which we may do one day we completely solve it you can just move the god to before that and even if we and it's like no it's not the god we, we identified another event before abiogenesis you can just move the god before that but you never have to identify the mechanistic relationship between the god and the and the phenomena that came after and that's not scientific, which means because you yourself admitted that you don't have to know that. Well, that's something we have to know, that, that, that we demand to know, that we have to know in order to posit that your hypothesis is connected to the, to the initial phenomena. Because if you can't do that, then, then why would – it's not scientific. That, that's the heart of the issue. So in that sense, you kind of just contradicted yourself that you can't ever, but by your own by your own lights, it can't ever be the best explanation because you yourself refuse to identify the mechanistic relationship between the cause and the event. Well, as I said previously, JL, um, we know by our own experience that the interface mind physics works. That's all what I need to know. And what do you mean by interface mind? 
Well, the thing is that I, as I explained previously, I can conceptualize um, how to instantiate um, a, mach a complex machine made of several interlocking parts for a specific purpose, and then I can transform that thought into the physical object, which is the physical blueprint, a piece of paper, take um, a, a, a pen, and then draw. Yeah, you, you said this blueprint. before. Right, exactly. But that's my answer. I have no yeah, but that, but that's not answer. that's not an answer. That's not an answer, though. What that's just you. What? That's just you repeating. What? That's just what? you repeating because just what? because just because you can conceptualize it doesn't mean it represents reality. Well, it uh, represents reality, JL, because that's what we experience, what we are capable of doing. So that is sufficient for me. I have empirical evidence that the interface mind body works it works you it happens jail and warning. we have proof by our own experience that we can use our mental intelligence and then put the blueprint in practice uh, draw it down on the paper and then it goes to the factory and their machine is built on the other side we have unguided random events which supposedly occurred on the prebiotic earth, which then supposedly should have given rise to the interface software and hardware, to the DNA molecule, and then the right interlinking and sequence, which would become instructional information to make a machine, and which is which are proteins. And this is something which has which is a complete failure, and what you have claimed is simply not true. I've gone through the scientific papers. I've written two books on the, the origin of life, of how science tries to explain these phenomena, how the, the, the basic building blocks of life could have emerged prebi prebiotically, and the problems, they are immense. And one of the immense problems is that when we are talking about the basic building blocks, we are speaking about four complex macromolecules, RNA, DNA, phospholipids, amino acids, and carbohydrates. These are complex chemical building blocks, and they are synthesized in the cell by very complex metabolic pathways, which were not extant prebiotically. And science has failed in 70 years to find even a plausible route. And do you know what the major problem is? And there your story ends, JL, and your worldview is bankrupt because of that, because there was no natural selection prebiotically, and you need to select the, uh, the, the, the nucleobases, the ribose, the phosphorus to make RNA and DNA. You need to select the 20 amino acids. They have to be left-handed chiral amongst a multitude of, of hundreds and hundreds of different amino acids which are not necessary for life. You need to have homochiral right and left-handed glycerol heads and fatty acids to have phospholipids, to have a cell membrane. You need to have um, homochirality. Oh, in Tangela, I, I know all this. Molecules. I know all this, dude. You're, okay, you're preaching so, to the choir. You're preaching to the yeah, choir here. Yeah, but let me, well, let me clarify. Let me, then, then, but everything... I've not finished yet. So what I want to say with this, JL, that your claim that naturalistic explanations are superior to intelligent design is just simply a pipe dream. And you are trying to just keep alive a zombie worldview, which is bankrupt. And you are doing this for years. I know you for a long time. The majority of atheists do that, and they don't do it based on reason. They do it based on their pre personal preference. But the reason and logic is on our side. It's not on your side. Angela, point of moderation. Let's try to cut down on the atheophobia a little bit. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, I'd really appreciate it if you didn't speak to my mental states, given that you do not have special access to them. But once again, you've already demonstrated, you've already expressed by your own lights that your method, that your hypothesis is completely unscientific. That's the point. You sit there, you call it the best possible explanation, and it's not because the, the things that you've identified, basically the gaps that currently exist in abiogenesis, because abiogenesis is a hypothesis. It's not a theory yet. So yes, we acknowledge, I readily acknowledge 
that there are gaps in the expl- in the a- in the abiogenesis explanation. Also, my atheism is not predicated upon the truth or falsity of abiogenesis, nor is it predicated upon the demonstrated truth of evolution. It's neither one. Because I understood these things before I ever deconverted and became an atheist. So not to mention, by your own lights, you've also admitted that it is logically possible for a god to exist in abiogenesis and evolution to be completely true, because those could be the means by which it cre- both created life and diversified life. There's no logical contradiction there. So the problem is, is that you consistently assert that your hypothesis is the best possible explanation, but it fails to address the mechanistic relationship between the cause and the, and the event. That's the problem. It's not scientific. So you can't sit there and claim that it is scientific and therefore is the best possible explanation when it doesn't even address how the God did it. It simply states that God did it, and that's the end of inquiry, which is categorically unscientific. And also, I have to add in there, with all of that diatribe that you spewed out twice now, because you repeated yourself again, none of that is relevant. None of it is, because all you're doing is identifying the gaps that exist in the abiogenesis that I agree with you on, but just because there are gaps in there doesn't mean that God fills the gaps. Just because we haven't found the mechanistic relationships yet doesn't entail that the answer is a God. You're simply identifying, you're simply taking the God, defining it as the thing that fills the gaps and made these things possible. When in five years, 10 years, 15 years, we could find those answers. And then all of a sudden you have to move your God back again. See, this is what I was trying to address at the very beginning, is that even if we found all the, even if we filled all the gaps made by Genesis and it became the official, it became the official theory, you know, as demonstrated as evolution, you could still move your God back one space in order to encompass all the evidence that we have. This is what you're not addressing. This is what you've never addressed. It's because okay, you can't all, bridge the gap. You can't bridge the gap between the creator, your, your proposed creator, and this and the phenomena. And until okay. you can do that, it's not scientific. Okay. First of all, JL, who is using here a gaps argument is you. Because you are saying, well, we don't know yet. Science doesn't have yet an explanation how it could have occurred by natural means. But we are working on it. Science is working on it. Right. And maybe tomorrow it will have an explanation and it will be a natural explanation. Well, that is a classical naturalism of the gaps. While I am not using a god of the gaps. What I'm I not am making a claim. But I'm not making a claim, Otangelo. I'm, I'm not, not claiming finished. abiogenesis is the answer. I've not I'm just saying that we... Yet. I've not finished yet. What I am saying is that... We know that intelligence can create blueprints. We know that intelligence can make complex machines based on multiple interlocking parts with a specific purpose. And what we are seeing is a connection between the instructional information stored in the genome, which is then transferred by um, complex machinery in the cell where it is translated in the ribosome to be transformed in complex molecular machines. And there is also an interdependence there. So what I am saying is that we know that intelligence can make both. It can make specified complexity and it can make irreducible complexity and it can create interdependence to achieve a specific goal. So my answer and my epistemology is not based on gaps, but Inference, I say it again, inference to the best explanation. And furthermore, we can actually test these things. The day that an atheist or a naturalist or a scientist can provide an explanation how these things could have originated by natural means, we talk. But I say it is not just something that science still has to work on it. It is deeper. It is a conceptual problem because unguided random uh, mechanisms simply do not instantiate and create such things. See, that that's a claim that you're making. And you, there's no evidence to indicate that it can't happen in, by natural means. We're not saying that it does. We're not saying we're not making claims to those gaps. We're working to find we're working to figure out what what is in those gaps. We're not we're not defining a thing as answering those questions 
and then simply stopping all inquiry. That's the problem. See, that that's that's the issue. And I don't know why you keep muting me when you keep misrepresenting me. And that's why I jump in there, because I'm not making any claims. I'm not claiming that abiogenesis is the answer. Where we are currently with the with origin of life research is that it's looking like abiogenesis is the answer. But there are parts that we are still missing. We understand a great deal of it, but as explained by a number of other creators, okay, and another a number of other you know origin of life researchers, we don't have all the pieces yet, which is fine. But we can't just assert answers that well, and define those answers as that which answers the question. That's not scientific. Well, science so, has absolutely no answers in regards of every relevant field related to abiogenesis and that starts with the fact that science doesn't know how the basic building blocks came to exist how they were selected how they were joined how they were polymerized how the curality was selected out how they how the i i uh, know this you don't need to repeat yourself well 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 let me finish please yeah I, i've heard well, all this before yeah, well, you, you don't need to repeat well, it to me well you heard it all before but you make unwarranted claims because you are saying that science has figured out already a lot of things. And I am responding to that. No, it has not. What science has brought to light is rather than molecules complexifying themselves uh, by natural means, they actually um, become asphalt. They disintegrate. There is a nice paper from Steve Penner from 2012, which has made it very clear and confirmed by Deemer that molecules, they disintegrate. That's exactly the contrary of what you need. And you don't need any kind of energy to drive molecular processes in the cell. You need ATP, which is a complex molecule made by a molecular turbine by ATP synthase. That also requires energy to ma make the ATP synthase itself. That becomes a circular problem because you need ATP synthase to make energy. You need energy to make ATP synthase. Well, what came first? Well, they had to be originated and created together. Okay, so none of that, once again, none of that is relevant to the point that I was making to you. None of it at all. I am not here to argue abiogenesis with you. Okay? I don't care what you think. Yeah. I don't think you I don't I don't care what you think you know about abiogenesis. I the, my initial question was not even about abiogenesis. My question was as to your claim that you have the best explanation. And I've already pointed out that you don't. That it is definitionally categorically unscientific what you are doing. You cannot pose an answer and just accept it as that what it is because it ceases all inquiry. And you obviously cannot state that you don't need to answer certain questions in regards to the mechanistic relationship between this thing you're hypothesizing and the phenomena. That is also decidedly unscientific. So that's all I was pointing out. And then you keep jumping away from that very issue. So I think I've made my point clear that yeah. what, you're, what you're proposing, what you're hypothesizing is not scientific by any stretch of the imagination, and you've already it conceded that you don't feel you need to answer those questions or even look for them, which is also not scientific. So I think I'm good. Okay, okay so someone else wants to um, jump in and has a question or something? Yeah, everybody should be unmuted. Anybody feel free to join in if you'd like to ask the great Otangelo a question. A question. Yeah, I would. I would like to ask a question. Otangelo, um, out of um, the different, would it? Would you be able to categorize the different um, building blocks that we would need for life to uh, uh, originate from um, purely chemical processes from inorganic matter to or, or organic matter? Um, out of all of those things, what what percentage do you think we actually have like a, a good understanding of that? Well, as I pointed out before, the the lack of natural selection is basically an end of story for any abiogenesis scenarios because you need to select the four basic building blocks, 
which I've said before, amino acids, um, nucleotides, phospholipids, and carbohydrates. And these are complex macromolecules, which in modern cells are synthesized by very, very complex metabolic pathways involving many steps and very different proteins, enzymes, and so forth, and signaling pathways, which were not extant prebiotically. So this is a huge, huge problem, which um, uh, I think is not, uh, it is not a matter of that science hasn't yet figured it out. It is a conceptual problem. Would you say that we're getting, uh, as I believe the last speaker was implying, we're getting closer to getting um, the answer, or do you think that the answer is receding away from right. us? As, 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 the more we were learning, the more we're realizing that we're further and further away from the actual solution. Well, you know, I very much welcome abiogenesis research because it has unraveled how complex actually everything is. And it has unraveled how the pathways leading to life are not plausibly explained by natural means. Like, for example, in order to make ribose, you need the Formosa reaction, but the Formosa reaction gives you 50 different products and they are all unrelated and unrelevant to have the molecule which is used in DNA and RNA, which is the ribose. And um, you need ribose in a right-handed homochiral form. And that was simply not extant prebiotically. And then furthermore, ribose is the most delicate um, molecule which disintegrates uh, in a very, very short period of time. And so these are uh, intractable problems and anyone saying science will solve it in the future, well, I don't believe so because if you don't have selection, how do you want to solve it? You will always have mixtures instead of uh, a bunch of, of prime nucleotides which you can use for life. Are you, are you saying that in, um, in principle, um, we cannot provide a natural explanation for how life arose. Well, even already in the 1980s, Karen Smith, which is a very well-known um, uh, English biochemist, he wrote several very good books in regards of the origin of life. And um, uh, in regards of nucleotides, he said there are 14 different steps required and they need to, usually when scientists try to recreate it in the lab, then they do it not in one pot reactions, but in different environments because they only, the, the different steps, they only progress in different environments. That's a, that's a huge problem. And he made um, a statistical analysis uh, uh, how, uh, what the chance would be that unguided random events could uh, perform these 14 steps in the right way it has to be. And it was a, a huge astronomical number. It was one in the billions. So I say the evidence has very strongly and clearly shown that unguided uh, events are simply not specific enough to come up with the, um, with the molecules that are required to, to make life. Even, and even if I give you a bunch of, of that's just based on our that's just based on our current understanding okay? like so for example if you had asked someone um uh, you know three four hundred years ago um are we going to be able to uh put a man on the moon um they would probably look at you like you were crazy right um we we didn't even have electricity we, we didn't have we we couldn't we couldn't even do anything on earth let alone get to the moon. So at that time period, I'm not sure if you had asked somebody like, in principle, is that possible or not possible? I would have presumed that they would have said, in principle, we can. It's just simply beyond our um, capability to understand how that might happen now. But there's no principled reason why it cannot be explained naturally. Um, okay, I will so, give you, I, let me give you yeah. a very, very um, an analogy here. If I am telling you 
please check if you have coins in your wallet. Then you might eventually telling me, well, I have no, no means right now to check if there are coins in my wallet. Then you cannot say if there are coins in the wallet or there aren't. I would compare that to the situation 400 years ago. Maybe 400 years ago, there was no technology to send a rocket to the moon. But now we have that ability and it was possible to do it. Now, um, if you are actually capable to look into the coin, into your wallet, and then you give me an answer, I have checked and I did not find any coins in the wallet, then this is an informed answer because you actually checked. And that is, in my understanding, the same situation with abiogenesis research, where science has checked during 70 years, and the outcome and the answer is simply, well, no, naturalistic explanations are inadequate to explain the complexity that we have unraveled um, in the molecular world. So um, it seems reasonable to, to think that intelligence was actually involved. And that would be the same answer to say I've checked in the wallet and I've not uh, not encountered any 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 coins. That is an informed answer. How would, you address, how, how would you address the uh, how would you address the argument that an intelligent mind set in place a natural world with processes inherent in it that will bring about certain results as a, that were built into the, into the design from the very start. How, how would we know whether that God chose to have life come about through a certain way, if, if there's no inconsistency with, with the scripture, assuming there, you know, if there's not, if it contradicts the Bible, then, then I would, I'm willing to accept that, but but absent that, is there a a reason taken from that that God could not have brought about life through any any method or or, or process that he that he wanted to? Well, the thing is, I believe that God cannot do um, illogical things, and if He created physical laws, and these physical laws operate in a way that it would not be possible to uh, complexify molecules to transition towards life, well, then it would not be possible. I mean, God, all, God's omnipotence must be defined. He cannot do illogical things and he cannot do anything. If uh, the, the goal is to make a car and... Uh, but here, but here well, you're not talking about logical impossibility, right? I'm sorry. You're talking about physical. You're talking, but I, I, but here we're not talking about. And I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, I, I would because I wanted to clarify that. Um, yes, I agree with you in terms of logical possibility. But I'm saying, like, in in science, um, no matter what the scientific theory is, since we cannot have a, a God's eye view of the universe. And, and take in all data um, instantaneously in formulating our theories. What we do is we limit the scope of the, of the inquiry, right? But in order to develop a theory, you have to exclude certain data and certain observations from the theory. And so that always leaves open the possibility that whatever data and observations that you're leaving out could provide either a deeper explanation than the one that you have or even potentially contradict the, the, the theory that you have, right? Because you, you don't have access to all the solutions. So it seems yeah, to me, and that's why, go ahead. Yeah, I tried to clarify what I was saying previously. Um, let me suppose that you are an engineer or a designer and I am asking you to make a Tesla car. And in order to have an electric car, you need batteries, right? Uh, if I don't give you the battery 
and you cannot resource it anywhere else, can you still make that car? That is no, a yes. It would be a nice, obviously, no, it would be a nice. So, and if on your behalf, instead of you, God would be at your place, and they would say, God, make the Tesla car without the battery. Would God be possible, able to make a car without the battery? If the goal is to make an electric car with the battery? No. So it makes no difference if you're talking about you, me, or God. God, he can be omnipotent, but he cannot do illogical things. But, he but, cannot but make but a Tesla car without the battery. But, and that is the same logical. Situation. And that's the same situation with, with life. If life requires a minimal set of parts, and you don't have that minimal set of parts, then even God cannot make life. So if you have a fully operational right. cell and you don't have a ribosome or you don't have an energy turbine to make ATP, you cannot have a self-replicating living cell. And it doesn't matter if we are asking God to do it or, or someone else, it's simply not logically possible. Well, I would agree that if, if we presuppose that those are the necessary preconditions for life, that it would not it would not be logically possible for God or anyone else to, to bring about life without without those conditions. But I guess the the root of the question that I'm asking is, how do you know, since all scientific theory excludes certain data and observation from the theory? Right, because we cannot have a God's eye view of all data and all observation. Right, so what we do is we limit it in some capacity. It has to be limited. There has to be data and observations that are outside the theory. And there's always the possibility from a philosophy of science perspective that the data that's excluded, the data that you didn't take into account, right? Because it's an empirical process. It, that well, that data argument, either. This is, let me interrupt you. This would be an argument from ignorance, where you make a claim there are flying potatoes on Mars, and um, then you ask me to disprove your claim. Well, you first you would have to prove that there are flying potatoes on Mars, and you cannot just simply make a claim and then say to others disprove my claim if you don't don't have any evidence. To back up that claim and that is the same related to abiogenesis you cannot say yeah. science in the future will will discover a way to to generate life from unguided means when there is no evidence whatsoever i think we well, should follow the that's evidence a lack of, that's a lack that's a lack of evidence now right like just because there's a lack of evidence i agree with you about it being the best explanation okay I, I'm, I'm totally on board with you that abiogenesis has basically, it, you might as well put it in dream theory, okay? It, it's, it's, it's almost at that level. So I'm not debating you on that. I'm sure other people have different views. But the, uh, the, the point that I'm, I'm ar arguing here is that as, from, a, from a scientific perspective, you cannot prove that there aren't potatoes floating around Mars. Science doesn't answer those types of questions. You could come up with philosophical arguments to say that it's on that you have no warrant and therefore unwarranted and unjustified beliefs, like you're like you're justified not believing them to be true, absent like certain uh, certain criteria, right? But that's a philosophical argument. Science can't say things. Science can't make those types of claims. Science but, can't, but can't can rule science, out certain science things. Science for me isn't the holy grail. Unless there's a contradiction. Unless and there's a contradiction. Science, and, and science isn't the, the goal. The goal is to find truth in regards of uh, origins. And science is just a tool which we use eventually to, to find evidence that can lead us to answer True these that. essential questions. And as I said right at the beginning of this stream, that my epistemological framework includes not only science, but as well philosophy and theology. And based on that construction, I hold my views.
Okay. I, I, I didn't hear I wasn't here for the beginning. That that I I I didn't realize that that, that was that was what your your claim was. So like that I, so would someone else like to ask a question? Because he, he answered all my questions. I know there's a lot of skeptics in here sometimes. You know, listen, I know sometimes people come in and it's just to listen and then, you know, they're working in the background. But I do sometimes see a lot of skeptics come in. And then when we have an expert like a, a, a Otangelo, they become quiet. Um, so this is the opportunity for people who are skeptical to, to raise questions. Like mathematician, I know a lot of times you have to raise questions with scientific yeah, so this is an open floor. So if anyone would, would I cannot speak. If anyone would like to pop in and ask a question, feel free to jump in. So Otangelo, can you tell me about the Great Flood? Have you done any research on that? On what? The flood in the Bible, the Great Flood. Oh, yes, let me tell you a little bit about this. So what happens is that in 2009 or 2010, there was a notice out that they supposedly encountered the Ark on Mount Ararat, a Chinese a group of people. And soon after this um, came out, it was just too good to be true, to tell the, the truth. That was like James Wyatt, I think, right? Was no. that his name? No, no. The James Wyatt arc is not on Mount Ararat. Uh, so, so you're saying that the James Wyatt arc was not claimed to be on Mount Ararat? No, it is, uh, uh, it is located outside of Mount Ararat. It is not on Mount Ararat. The structure which they claim that is um, Noah's Ark, which I don't believe it is, is not on Mount Ararat. The, 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 the structure that I am talking about um, was found in 2008 by a local um, called Parachute. And um, in 2000, and they had, I think, two or three expeditions by these Chinese people. They went to, to, to the ark, they entered the structure. They made even a two hours video on it. And yes, Ron Wyatt, but that's not the structure that I'm talking about. Okay. So um, soon after that notice came out, rumors started that this was actually a hoax and that the locals, they wanted to make money with um, ARC um, searchers and that they planted the wood, that they took some wood from the Black Sea and transported it to 14,000 feet on the, on, the, on the mountain, and that they supposedly constructed their kind of a, a movie scenario just to fool the Chinese and other expedition uh, people and just get, get their money. So that was the rumor that came out, and I had no reason to doubt that story. And I mean, since that would have really been um, an extraordinary uh, uh, finding, I dismissed the, the claims. Then in 2021, I think, um, occasionally I met a guy, his name is Philip Williams on Facebook, and he was claiming that he actually visited that structure and that immediately catched my attention and my interest because meeting someone which uh, would have visited it, that what would have been a rare encounter. And he has videos on uh, YouTube uh, where he uh, shows his expedition and that catched obviously very much my interest and I wanted to know more about this story. So um, I interviewed him several times on my the YouTube channel. We had several interactions. I started to investigate also the, the hoax rumors. And um, the main guy claiming that this, that this structure was a hoax 
was is a guy named Don Patton. He's uh, from the United States, and he was searching the Ark who, uh, previously for a long time and with, with no success. And um, I called him. I have um, recorded that calling. We talked about 90 minutes on the phone, and I pressed him hard in order to have um, that he would reveal the evidence that he has that effectively the locals did bring up wood up to the mountain and mounted that, that structure. And he simply had no evidence. He just made a claim, but he wasn't able to back it up. And then there was another guy, his name is Murat Sahin, from, from uh, uh, the same city near, near Mount Ararat, which also was making the same claim, and they called him. And I had also a very long conversation with this guy, and it came out that he didn't have any evidence whatsoever either. So in the end, I had to say, well, these rumors, they are not backed up by hard evidence that this structure was, was planted. And um, based on, on the research that I have done, I uh, believe that it is very plausible that this is in, indeed a Noah's Ark. What is your like? Uh, what what is your standard of evidence? What would you say like constitutes as evidence, uh, and what does not constitute as evidence? I want to like better understand your gray area. Well, for me, evidence, first rate evidence for me is visual information, movies, photographs, and we have plenty of that. There is a two hour movie from this Chinese team. There are some people from Belgium that have visited the site. Um, there, are there are movies as well on YouTube about their expedition. We have a lot of pottery from the, the, the structure, which is clearly Bronze Age and pottery. And um, then there is the expedition of Philip Williams, which is an eyewitness, which has been there. He has seen the structure and he is a very uh, integer, integer person. and um, um, we have his movies. He has written books about the subject. Uh, so, yeah, that's the evidence that I, I am relying on. What would you consider is not enough evidence for something? Can you give us an example? Well, I think um, you cannot simply classify that into black and white. I think you need to spend time to put the, the, the things together, the, the puzzle, you need to take an, a little bit information here, a little bit information there. You have to check what those are saying that deny it. You have to check uh, what those say that um, say it's, it's true, it's genuine. And then you have to weight it um, one against the other and then come up with a conclusion. Do you use evidence to understand what is true? Like, do you hold to the correspondence theory of truth? Well, I think that this uh, evidence is very relevant, yes. Okay, so do you require evidence to believe something? Uh, yes, I, I need evidence. Okay. okay, so do you believe Jesus walked on water? Yes. And why do you believe that? Do you want a straightforward uh, answer? I believe it because we have the Shard of Turin. The what? The because, Shroud of Turin? Oh, yes. wait, that's, what does that have to do with walking on water? Well, if Jesus rose from the dead, if he resurrected, if he left us an image which was not made by human hand, which was made basically by VUV light, if he can do a miracle like that, then he has power over matter and he has power over the laws of physics and he can do miracles and he is God. Do you agree that you can use that then to justify that he can do anything? I just explained previously that I think omnipotence has to be defined. Okay, that's fine. What I, my, my question though is that like, do you agree that everything is everything logically possible is truly fair game for you to believe in? 
No. Why? Well, because there are many things which there are no logical contradictions, but we know that uh, there is no evidence to back, to back them up. I can I can say that John Farto farted the universe into existence. Is there any logical contradiction in my claim? No, there isn't. Is it plausible that it happened? I think no, because we do not have any evidence to, to back up that claim. But your your claim earlier was that the Shroud of Turing or whatever it's called, uh, Torin or whatever, uh, is somehow evidence that Jesus actually did walk on water. Well, right. it is evidence for me that he is who he said to be, that the Gospels are true, that he was but, crucified, that he resurrected. And uh, once I have evidence that all these things which I just mentioned are true, then I am warranted to believe that the other miracles um, uh, uh, reported in the Gospels are true as well. And that's simply because there's no logical contradiction entailed. It's not only that there is no logical contradiction. Uh, I think that it is a construction where you come to a conclusion. There are 360 um, uh, prophecies in the Old Testament that have been fulfilled in Jesus. I listed them in my book, um, Confirming Jeshua. Um, then we have the Gospels. We have... Um, uh, how do you but then you it? use that to make unfalsifiable no, claims. No, no, let me finish. Then we have um, um, undesigned coincidences in the Gospels. I, I write extensively on this in my book as well. There are other books as well which write. I understand your point. I'm not like confused about that point. Uh, okay. I understand that like you, uh, you believe that like because he's proven that he's God that he's capable of doing these things like walking on water, right? That's your point? Yes. Okay. Do you agree that you are now uh, making those particular claims unfalsifiable by by uh, by grounding all of your uh, logic here on the evidence of the shroud? Do you agree yeah. with that? Yes, yes, I agree with you. Okay, that's it. That's dumb. It's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Well, I don't care. I was sort of thought if we talk, for example, excavate a uh, archaeological. Yes, I have a lot of uh, of things which are mentioned in the Gospels. Uh, archae archaeological uh, artifacts confirm what is. Uh, we know that the the writers, the 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 authors of the Gospels, they must have been at a certain point in the past they must have lived in Palestine because they make mentioning of places and artifacts and so forth and um, we we have the confirmation that these well, artifacts and places exist so as I said this is a construction I understand your point where you take where you take evidence from well, several well. lines and then um, come to a conclusion yeah I understand really? your point you you, I agree. I just wanted to respond to Matthew. I just wanted to respond or clarify a question mathematician was asking. If we dug up a, 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 at an archaeological site the remains of Jesus, right, his skeleton, would falsify Christianity and the claims yes. of the resurrection? Absolutely. Yes. yes. So he said it's unfalsifiable, and that's good. So yes, again, is, my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. It's, it's, it's a good point. The resurrection of Jesus can be falsified by someone finding the bones of Jesus, which then somehow someone would have <laughs> to say these are the bones of Jesus. Yeah. So, like for example, there could be it's just like any other um, archaeology. God, I don't understand there. how you could be this like brain rot. I'm sorry. It's like. Honestly, um, like fucking just pre sub bullshit. And at, at, at homes, or don't advance anything about position, right? What we're saying is like you said it's unfair. I'm stepping away from this conversation because I've, I'm realizing I'm engaging with someone who's closed minded. Hey, this is an right? AMA for Otangelo. Let's calm down, guys.
Yeah, and I would say this. If you can demonstrate that the, the Shroud of Turin is um, a forgery from the 14th century, well, hey, go and and, and uh, get your $1 million uh, prize, which has been um, uh, offered by David Wol Rolf, by whom can demonstrate that it, it is a forgery. So, hey, what are you waiting for? Yeah, that's not my job. And obviously the fact that you think that it's well, my then, job to do that well, then, well, then you tells have me a no lot warrant. about how you actually think about science. Well, listen, then you have no warrant to laugh about my position because yes, it, I do. Should, it should be actually me laughing about your position because you are incredulous towards an artifact where over a hundred scientific faculties have been employed to try to 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 show how a forger could have made the artifact, and that's they did not. not find that's, that's, any, it's just they did not find any trace or evidence whatsoever that the shroud of Turin, the image on the shroud, was made by a forger. So I think, by all, with all respect, I think that I am warranted with my belief, and you are not warranted with your incredulity. Okay, so. Your uh, your philosophy of science doesn't seem like well rounded here. Uh, to be just like with all due respect, like you're you're telling me that you 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 don't have to like provide any direct evidence that Jesus water water because just because you have this shroud that you think that nobody else has provided evidence that it's a forgery. That's that's how far down this hole we've gone now. Right. This is like this is a really bad hole that you need to dig yourself out well, let of. Me, let me tell you something. I believed that Jesus is who he said to be when I converted in 1984. OK. And I okay, didn't great. need the shroud to believe that he walked on water. I didn't well, need. You're using him right now. I did. I didn't need that kind of evidence. And the shroud has just confirmed what I previously already believed. That's okay. I'm sorry. It, it's not that it confirms it. It's the whole groundwork of your argument that we that you you justified uh, that Jesus walked on water. You made the point that Jesus walking on water it it, it can be uh, proven using the shroud. That no, make no, any sense no, to no. That was a construction that you tried to imply to me. I've never made that connection. I've never said that because you've never made that connection, blue, and I lost. Well, well, well. You brought that up and asked me if I would say that the shroud eventually would be actually no. That was my 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 logic, but I stand to it. If you are asking me why I <laughs> believe that, I know you do. Yes, why I believe that Jesus walked on water, then I'd say I believe it based on the Gospels, on the Gospel accounts, and I believe it because I investigated all the evidence that leads to the historical Jesus, and the Shroud of Turin is part of it. And so it is one of the puzzles, of the puzzle pieces that I am putting together to say it confirms what I already believed. But it allows you to it allows you to create any unfalsifiable claim you want, because in order for me to prove you wrong, I have to prove the shroud of Turing wrong, right? Which is so it, it, it's it's just idiotic, right? We have to focus on this other thing, the shroud, in order for for you to to make your point about specifically walking on water, right? You. For you to say that you value evidence, to me, just like I, I, I don't see how the shroud is connected to whatever claim you want to make about Jesus, including that well, he walked on water well, or well, that he killed. He killed he, 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 he must landmine. Uh, why? Go ahead. Well, draw a response. Yeah, no, you can have as much objection as you want. I really, really don't care. What I am saying is that for me. The, the the shroud is the direct link, the, the empirical link that corroborates the gospels as true, and that includes all the miracles that are reported there. But then, but then that means that the whole gospel is true, right? You're saying the whole entire gospel is true because of this 
evidence that you and all of the, the evidence that you've compiled, like you've written books on, right? You 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 are you have overwhelming evidence to believe that everything in the Gospels is true, right? And the thing is, you haven't actually provided me anything that's directly connected to specifically physically walking on water, right? You just gave me a, an overwhelming evidence about some other things, right? And sure, maybe you can prove 99% of the gospel, and but that doesn't make this 1% about walking on water true. For you to say that is just appealing to an authority. I don't know why this this kind of fixation in regards of uh, Jesus walking on water. If Jesus is God, if he created the laws of physics, if he is the, the creator of the entire universe, then I see absolutely no problem why he should not be capable of walking on water or feeling the blind. That's not my point. Of doing, of doing all the miracles that he has. Well, my point is that um, my faith is based today on a construction of several lines of evidence with, which converge to the same final viewpoint and worldview, which is that the Christianity is true. Okay, so do you agree that there are scientists that have written, published many research papers that have been verified to be true in the scientific community? Yes, sure. Okay, do you agree that we should listen to every single thing that they say? Well, it depends. If you are talking about science papers that are unraveling um, things in the natural world which are, which are true, which, uh, which are indisputed today, then there, there, there is no reason to, to doubt these papers, and I actually use these papers as evidence. No. That's not my question. Okay, so my question please. is like, if if a, let's say if a, I know a researcher, right, who's published his whole life, right? He's in his seventies. Uh, he's he's got his whole career already like finished up, um, and everything he's published has been uh, internationally recognized in uh, prestigious journals. So my question to you is. Should I believe everything? If this guy comes up to me and says, you know what? Kids are dumb. Like, should I just believe kids are dumb? Of course not. What's your point? My point is that just because you can prove 99% of the Gospels does not mean you have evidence directly for the, the walking on water part. Even if I grant you what you're saying, that you have all this evidence, that you can prove all the other parts of the Gospels or whatever, right? Then you still have, you, sh you should still have a standard by which you determine whether or not he actually did walk on water. And right now you're telling me the standard is that he's, done, he's proven all these other things, right? Which again, so has this researcher that, I've, that I know. I, I really don't understand where you want to go with this. My my question to you is, do you have any direct evidence of physically walking on water? I told you, no, I don't. Nobody has. All right, I'll take that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the questions. If anybody else in the audience would like to talk with Otangelo, he uh, is answering the hardest of hard questions tonight. So we'll do a final call for questions. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Otangelo, you are awesome. Thank you so much for doing an AMA with us. You're the best. Uh, do you have anything you would like to close out with? Anything that you'd like to talk about? Uh, even just say you had fun, you know? Uh, anything like that? 
Oh, I think it's a great format, Taco. I, I, I welcome it. Uh, it was in special good because there was no over talking and I was in control and I could mute people that over talked me. So I think it is um it's it's great. I I um, congratulate you for the initiative and idea, and I hope it will be a success and also also your new channel. Oh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Do Do you have anything that you want to share? Though I I, I do appreciate that. I, I was saying more like anything that you want to share about you or books that you're working on releasing, stuff that people should buy, work that you've done, stuff like that. Anyone that doesn't know uh, and wants to find uh, where I collect and publish uh, my my information can go to reasonandscience.catsport.com. And um, if you want to check my YouTube channel, it uh, the name is The God Talk on YouTube. And if you want to check out my books, just uh, search with my name on Amazon. We really appreciate having you here. Everybody in the audience, you're all awesome. Thank you for coming and hanging out with us and talking with Otangelo. Uh, once again, thank you for your time. You have a wonderful evening, sir, and uh, I'm sure we'll see you probably at the next CS Helpline. Sure. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. See you next time. Thank you, sir.